My first job in ministry uh, came as a part-time youth pastor at a small church in Glen Ellen called Glen Ellen Bible Church in the early 1980s. I served there for just under two years while I was finishing my way through seminary. And that was the very first time I was responsible uh, for teaching the Bible as the Word of God. I taught a group of high school students, maybe 15 or so, every Sunday morning in Sunday school. And even though I grew up around the Bible, my dad was a pastor, I've told many stories about those years, and I grew, knew I had a calling of God to go into ministry, I look back and I'm pretty sure I was a pretty bad teacher as I was just getting started out. And I, I know that because of a story I'm going to tell you now. I remember teaching one Sunday morning to those uh, students uh, back in the early 80s, 1983, 84, somewhere around there. And I remember I was teaching uh, from the Gospel of John. It was something about the, um, in fact, Mark, where are you? Mark Toma? Mark is over here. Mark um, was actually a student I knew back in those days, and he's, life has turned around, and he's back out here with us at FECG. So Mark may remember me from those days, and, and he, <laughs> thanks, Mark. Um, I was teaching something about uh, the theme of light and darkness in John's theology, something I'd learned in one of my seminary classes, something I thought was really cool in kind of a seminary student kind of way. And I wasn't experienced enough at the time to notice that the kids I was teaching had no idea what I was talking about. Uh, they had long since stopped paying attention, but I didn't notice. And by the way, I, I have often said since those days that anyone who wants to teach or preach to adults should be forced to teach high school and junior high students for at least 10 years because they will teach you how to teach. And here's why. See, adults, adults will, will and can fake like they're listening. Adults can do that. Like it's quite possible right now some of you are thinking about something else but looking at me like you're listening. You're thinking about, you know, what you're having for dinner tonight. You're thinking about the Cubs game, whether they play or not. What time is that again? And you're thinking about your grocery list or whatever. But you're looking at me like you're listening. You might even be nodding your head. Adults can do that, and I could never know. But students don't do that. If they lose interest, they just fall backwards, throw paper, giggle, get on their phone. They just make it obvious. But I didn't really notice. And I thought I was pretty awesome that day. So the very next day, on Monday, I met with two high school uh, guys uh, for lunch. I remember it was at a pizza hut. And while we were waiting for our personal pan pizzas to arrive, I, I just couldn't resist. You know, I just couldn't resist to ask them a question about the awesome lesson I taught the day before. So I said to one of the guys, I said, so tell me, what do you remember most about yesterday? And this poor kid looked at me surprised and, and kind of frightened. Like he would look at me if I had green horns sprouting out of my head, just deer in the headlights, and he, he rubbed his chin, and he acted like he was trying to think of something. He stammered, and he finally said, uh, Jesus? <laughs> he didn't have any idea. I learned a couple of things during that lunch. First, I learned that high school students can be, can be very honest, even when not, they're not trying to be. And second, I learned I had a lot to learn as a teacher. Now, for nine months, we've been preaching through the great story of Jesus and the Gospels. And Jesus was the greatest teacher who ever lived. And we're going to talk about his most famous teachings over these next seven weeks. We're in a summer series now called The Way of Blessing, The Kingdom of God in Everyday Life. And we're going to be looking for seven weeks at the Sermon on the Mount. It comes to us in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, one of the most famous of all of Jesus' teachings, words that take probably less than 30 minutes to read straight through, but have been repeated, studied, memorized, and remembered for 2,000 years. He was the greatest teacher who ever lived. Now, scholars debate as to whether or not the so-called Sermon on the Mount was delivered all at one time like one sermon, like I'm doing here today, or whether it was a collection of some of his most pithy, memorable sayings. I tend to think it was the second, but we don't, we don't really know for sure. But either way, these three chapters are astonishing in their depth and breadth of spiritual truth. So we're going to begin in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And you can look on the screen or look in your personal Bible as I re read the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, when he saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. Now, Jesus here is near the Sea of Galilee, uh, where he spent a lot of his time in his early ministry. And the Sea of Galilee is surrounded by these sort of gentle sloping hills uh, going up away from the, the lake. And he was uh, retreating from the crowds, going up into the hills there. Uh, 
to where he often went to pray and so forth, and he sat down, it says. And his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying. Let me pause here again. Jesus is, notice, notice, notice he's withdrawn from the crowds, and he's just with his disciples. So he's with his closest followers, uh, and he sits down to teach. This is the ancient way of a rabbi. Uh, in our culture, uh, we usually stand up to teach. In that culture, they would sit down to teach. And by the way, I'm sitting down now. Many of you know I've, I've had a long struggle with arthritis in my hips, and it's finally gotten so bad uh, that I'm sitting down because I don't trust myself to stand up. Uh, and I have my first replacement surgery coming this Thursday. My right hip's going to be replaced Thursday. And hopefully, by the end of the summer, early in the fall, I get the other one replaced. And then you won't have to worry about me toppling off the stage and falling down and that sort of thing. So that's why I'm sitting down. Now, Matthew uh, 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, before we begin, I want to uh, cover one assumption that's very important as we begin this, this study on this passage. You need to know that, that Jesus is not presenting here a kind of new set of religious rules to live by. He's not saying, if you do these things, then you're going to be able to earn your way into the kingdom of heaven. That's not what he's saying. I don't know if you noticed, but the whole world uh, remembered Muhammad Ali this past week. One of the most famous people ever walked the face of the earth. And Muhammad Ali was, uh, by all measures, and I did a little research and looked back at some old videos, um, he was a very religious man, for all, for all we can tell. Converted to a version of Islam early in his life and, and pursued religion uh, seriously. And I found a, a video in which he sort of described what he believed about God. And he was uh, very, very sincere in the, his belief. And here's what he said, something like this. He said, I believe God sees everything that we do, everything we do, the good and the bad. And my goal in my life is to make sure I do more good things than bad things by the time I die. Now, that's the way a lot of people think about God, and that's admirable. It's good to want to do good things with your life. It's good to want to do good for others. And Muhammad Ali did a lot of good things in his life. But that's not what the gospel says. That's, in fact, the Bible teaches almost the opposite of that assumption. The Bible teaches we cannot do enough good things to earn our way into heaven. Uh, we cannot earn our way into the kingdom of God. The Bible teaches that every single one of us has sinned or fallen short, and that our sin separates us from a holy God, and that our sins are forgiven and our relationship with God restored through faith in Jesus Christ, crucified and risen again. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Paul says in Ephesians 2, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. So, Jesus is not setting up a new set of religious rules here. So what is he doing? Jesus, I think, is telling us what it looks like when his followers, those who have been forgiven and been transformed by his grace, bring the kingdom of God into everyday life. He's telling us what that looks like. We like to say at FBCG that the gospel transforms people and transform people make an impact in the world for Christ's kingdom. That's, I think, what Jesus is talking about. Now, these verses have historically been called the Beatitudes, and that's a word, to us that come, the word that comes to us from the Latin. Uh, Jeff would be proud of me. Uh, the Latin word is beatus. It means blessed or fortunate. Eight times Matthew uses the word in Greek, which is makarios, which could be translated happy. But it's a happy that's, that's richer in meaning than what we mean in English when we say happy. It means 
one who has received the provision of God or one who is enjoying the favor of God. And the Beatitudes, if you notice as I read through them, are sort of a set of pithy little sayings. Uh, They're easy to remember, uh, easy to repeat, and to pass on. Almost as if Jesus knew that we would be using Twitter today. I went through and almost all of the Beatitudes fit in 140 characters. It's remarkable to me. And I had an idea. And I've already tweeted a couple things tonight from the service. If you use Twitter, let's try to start a little thing using the hashtag. So whatever you hear tonight over the next seven weeks that make an impact on your mind or heart uh, from God's Word, tweet that, but use the hashtag way of blessing. Hashtag way of blessing. All right, let's see if we can get a hashtag going here. It just might be kind of fun. So Jesus is saying, says four things, I think, about the way of blessing. First, the way of blessing is surprising. The way of blessing is surprising. A few years ago, um, I heard, I think my brother told this the first time I heard it, a little parable of a poor farmer and his son. The poor farmer and his son were so poor, their only possession was a fine horse. The famine came to their land. And all the villagers said to the poor farmer, there's a famine, Uh, in order to eat, you have to sell your horse. And the farmer said, no, I love my horse. I'm not going to sell my horse. And then the horse ran away. And the villagers said, see, we told you, now you have nothing. The farmer said, well, you don't know yet whether that's bad or good. A few days later, the horse came back and brought 20 wild stallions with him. The villagers said, wow, that's good, now you're a rich man. The farmer said, well, you don't know yet whether it's good or bad. A week later, his son fell off one of the wild horses and broke his arm. The villagers said, that's bad. The farmer said, well, we don't know yet whether that's good or bad. Then war came to the land, and his son stayed home while all the other young sons went out to fight in a war because his son couldn't fight. Now, the parable goes on and on, but the point is clear that sometimes blessing comes to us in disguise. Sometimes blessing is surprising, and, we, and it's hidden at first. In the same way, Jesus begins here by saying there's something counterintuitive, almost countercultural about God's way of blessing. Think of it this way. When we typically think of the blessings of our lives, when we use the phrase, I'm blessed, I think we usually mean that when something really good happens to us. We're usually referring to something really good that's taken place in our lives, either material blessings, our homes, our our jobs, our incomes, as in the Lord blessed us with this beautiful home. Uh, We we hear that all the time. Or we think of personal good fortune, good health, acceptance into a top university, a tornado just misses our neighborhood. And of course, that's true. Those are blessings, and we can be grateful for those. But notice, Jesus goes in a whole different direction here. He starts this teaching on the way of blessing by saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. We want to go, if you're paying attention, we should go, whoa, 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 whoa. What? Come again? For a moment there, it sounded like you said, blessed are the poor in spirit. For just a minute, I thought you said, blessed are those who mourn. It sounds a little bit, Jesus, like you're saying, blessed are the unfortunate. Blessed are the unlucky. You're kind of saying, blessed are the unblessed. What? What? Doesn't make sense. What's he saying? Well, let's look at the words. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. The Greek word for poor is is tokoi. It's the same word you would use to describe someone who possesses very few resources, a penniless person, someone who's broke, maybe someone who's homeless. One of my sons and I were in New York City uh, real quick two days this past week, had to take some subways to get somewhere. And every subway train we got on, shortly after we sat down, somebody got on the train and began walking down the train saying out loud, I am homeless, I don't have anything, can anybody spare any change for a homeless person? And every subway car we got on, someone did that. And I thought to myself, how desperate would you have to be? What would that feel like to spend your days begging because you had nothing? That's the word poor poor in spirit. Jesus is saying blessing comes to those who are desperate for God, those who have nowhere else to turn, those who are broken and destitute. 
Just last week, I sat with a family in my office, a family that had suffered a terrible loss, all committed followers of Jesus, but the sudden loss of a loved one had just devastated their hearts, plunged them into what Psalm 23 calls the valley of the shadow of death. Many of you know what that's like. You've been there in your own lives. You know what that feels like, at least what it felt like for you. The best way to put it is they were desperate, desperate for God, desperate for something to make sense of their, their pain. Jesus is saying here that there is blessing when you are desperate for God, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. He says, blessed are those who mourn. The Greek word here means to grieve, as in to grieve over a death or to grieve the end of a relationship. It it carries the sense of an outward expression of grief, grief, quite literally a wailing and a weeping. We're going to look more at this in just a moment, but Jesus here is referring to a, a deep kind of spiritual grief over not just the sin and brokenness of the world around us, but also over one's own sin and brokenness. He's saying there's a blessing, there's a unique kind of blessing when your heart is broken by the things that break the heart of God. You will be comforted, he says. And then he says, blessed are the meek. When we think of the word meek, we tend to think of weak or timid or kind of spineless people. You know, the people that get pushed around at work, people that get pushed around on the playground, the people that let others take advantage of them. But that's not what the word means in Jesus' usage here. It carries the meaning of a kind of mature humility, a a strength under control, the meekness of a person who gets cut off by a rude driver, but instead of honking and gesturing in anger, slows down and just waves the other person in. There's blessing for the meek, Jesus says for they will inherit the earth. That's a reference to the new heaven and new earth, the heaven itself. See, Jesus is redefining, I think, how we think about God's blessing. And here's the surprise. God's blessing, God's favor, God's grace, God's provision, God's joy is poured out not through the material blessings that we usually think about in our culture. And why do we usually think about that in our culture? Because we live in the most affluent, abundant culture on the face of the earth. That's why it's easy for us to think about blessing as those things. But that's lazy thinking, Jesus says. It comes to us not through cars and houses and money and good health. Rather, God's blessing is poured out into the hearts of those who are desperate for Him. To those who are dependent on God's provision and God's presence. For they are the ones who will receive the kingdom of heaven. They are the ones who will be comforted. They are the ones who will inherit the earth, he says. That's how he begins. So now we're paying attention. Secondly, he says, the way of blessing blesses others. The way of blessing is surprising, and the way of blessing blesses others. One winter a few years ago, and I don't remember which one it was, we had a huge snowstorm in our area. I just remember waking up to something like 38 inches of snow on the ground. Now, my family and I have lived in this area for 30 years, 30 years this summer, and we don't have a snowblower. Sometimes people ask me, why don't you have a snowblower? And I said, because I have four sons. <laughs> I have four snow shovelers. And if I join the mix, we have five. Or actually, now it's more like four and a half, I think they would say. Well, for some reason, on this particular day, I don't know, maybe because they had basketball practice or whatever, but I was out there by myself. 30 inches of snow, long driveway, and I shoveled for an hour and a half by myself, and I cleared like 10 feet of my driveway from here to the second row. That was it. I still had like 80 feet to go. I don't know how long my driveway is, but it's long. The lady who lives across the street, kind of that way across the, our cul-de-sac, came out after I did. It's a lady. She came out after I did, but she's got this ginormous, like, nuclear-powered snowblower, <laughs> right? And she's going, it's blowing snow all over the place. So by the time I got 10 feet in, she's done. Driveway neat, you know, neat rows, neat walls, neat, done. <laughs> and I'm not proud of this, but my heart was darkened with bitterness and envy. I'm sweating profusely. It's 15 degrees outside. I'm sweating through my sweatshirts and my jacket. I'm exhausted. Still have 80% of my driveway to go. I was this close. Some of you guys know what I'm talking about. Just going inside and waiting for spring, right? It all goes away eventually. That's my, my theory, right? Just about then, I noticed that that lady 
was heading across the street, up the, up the sidewalk, toward my house with her ginormous snowblower. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, she goes, you want to use this to finish the job? Have I mentioned to you how much I love my neighbor lady? <laughs> finish the job. Jesus says, blessed are the merciful. That word means the compassionate, for they will be shown mercy. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. That refers to making known the healing of God's Spirit, for they will be called sons of God. In other words, blessed are those who see and sense the pain of others. And instead of avoiding it and retreating into the cocoon of their own comfort, which is really a definition of the suburbs, isn't it? That's what we do. Rather, reaches out and engages their neighbor with compassion and healing. Blessed are those who bless others, Jesus is saying. Over the past couple of months, Pastor Jeff, I'm sure you're going to hear him talk about it this summer, maybe even tomorrow at the church family meeting, but he's been reading a book and has told me about it and I ordered it. It just hasn't arrived yet. It's a book called The Art of Neighboring. And the quote Jeff's been using, and it's a wonderful quote, is every Christian should be a gift to his or her neighborhood and every church should be a gift to its community. Every Christian should be a gift to his or her neighborhood and every church should be a gift to its community. The Sermon on the Mount is all about what the kingdom of God looks like in everyday life. Jesus says later in the Sermon on the Mount that it's like light. Light sort of shows the way. It's like salt. Salt was a preservative in those days. It preserved from corruption. Here he says it's blessing. The followers of Jesus are to bring blessing and mercy and compassion and peace to where it is that they live, to their neighborhoods. If you've come to any of our church family meetings or watched online, you know that, that we believe God is leading us as a church into a vision that we're calling Neighborhood Church. A family of neighborhood churches committed to, to, uh, trans, to, the, to transforming people through the power of the gospel and those people transforming communities. We believe God wants his people, his followers, to bless others. He wants his church to bless communities. That's what that vision is about. And tomorrow we have another church family meeting at noon at the West Campus if you want to hear more about it. So the way of blessing blesses others. Thirdly, the way of blessing pursues God. The way of blessing pursues God. Think about this for a moment. When was the last time you were truly, really hungry or thirsty? Now, I know we all say all the time, oh, I'm starving. But that's not really true. Because we are surrounded all the time with food and drink. It's hard for me to remember the last time I was really hungry or thirsty. I do remember playing high school football back in the day, and we would have these three-a-day summer practices, which I think are illegal today. Uh, but we'd be out there in the field three times, 90-degree heat, just like, just like today. And our coaches would use water breaks for reward and punishment right? Some of you guys remember this. If we were practicing well, we would get water breaks. If we didn't practice well, we would be denied water. Now think about that just for a minute, whether that makes sense or not. I think that's illegal now as well today. But I can remember having, during a bad practice, and my team, some of my teams were not very good, I remember having almost no water breaks. Like three hours in the afternoon, no water breaks, because we didn't deserve it, right? Have you ever, do you, have you ever experienced what cotton mouth is? When, like, the inside of your mouth gets coated with this nasty white, like, gunk, and it's just awful, and you have a mouthpiece in, and I remember promising myself, I mean, internally promising myself, that if we ever got that water break, I was going to drink water till it came out my nose. <laughs> I promised myself that. I'm going to drink until it just bursts out of my nostrils. I don't think I ever quite accomplished that, but I tried, okay? We live in a world where we are rarely, if ever, truly hungry or thirsty for anything in our culture. Jesus says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. See, hunger and thirst are the most basic, most powerful of all human biological drives, the most insatiable of our needs and desires. And here's the question I found myself asking myself this week. When have I, when have you hungered for God's word like a starving man? When have you thirsted for God's righteousness 
like a football player in three-a-day practices. I came across this little poem years ago, and I remembered it because it made an impact on me. It's written by a fellow named Wilbur Reese. It's called Three Dollars of God. I would like to buy three dollars worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of him to make me love a black man or pick beats with a migrant. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. That poem packs a punch, and it does because it, it hits close to home, I think. Sometimes I think, maybe that's what I've settled for. We who live in an affluent and comfortable culture, the most affluent culture on the face of the earth, maybe we settle for three dollars of God. We see our good fortune as the blessing of God and miss the blessing that Jesus is talking about in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they will be satisfied, filled. Jesus is saying those who follow me, those who live in the kingdom of God, will desire, will long for my righteousness, for purity, the way a starving man aches for food, the way a thirsty athlete longs for water. And that hunger, that thirst for God, will produce the blessing of seeing and knowing God himself, relationship with God himself. So the way of blessing pursues God. And fourth, Jesus is saying, I think, the way of blessing includes pain. The way of blessing includes pain. How many here are fans of the movie The Princess Bride? Anybody? Oh. <laughs> Not nearly enough of you. One of the great cinematic uh, creations of all time called The Princess Bride. Goofy movie made some 30 years ago, and I can still quote some of the lines. Lines like, join me if you know these lines. Hello, my name is Indigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die, right? Or how about this one? No more rhyming, and I mean it. Anybody want a peanut? Later in the movie, there's an exchange between... Um, if you don't know the movie, just tolerate this for just a moment. It's going somewhere. There's an exchange between Princess Buttercup and Wesley... <laughs> Wesley's the hero of the story. He's disguised as the dread pirate Roberts, uh, who the princess thinks has killed her beloved Wesley. I know it's very complicated. But at one point, she says to him, you mock my pain. And he says, right back, life is pain, highness. And anyone who tells you differently is selling something, he says. I've always said truth shows up in some funny places. Jesus says here, I think, the way of blessing includes pain. Verse 4, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who grieve the brokenness of the world and grieve their own brokenness, for they will be comforted. There's some pain there. Verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, say falsely all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Question, who here likes being insulted? Just raise your hand. How about being persecuted, being made fun of, being mocked? Anyone? Anyone sign up? Me neither. How can blessing be found in mourning, persecution, and insult? How does that work? Now, I, I could point, I could take a long time and point to pastors and missionaries like Tom Randall, who spoke back here in the spring at FBCG, was imprisoned wrongly in the Philippine Islands for three years, almost lost his life. I could point to men and women throughout history and even today in places like Turkey, Syria, Afghanistan, who have been mocked, insulted, persecuted, beaten, threatened, imprisoned, and how they experienced through all of that the incredible blessing of God. I could point to all those stories. You could read about them all you want. But I want to wrap up with a, with a little story, another little parable that I think kind of speaks to us more where we live in our 
culture. And it's, it's rather, it, it's, it's, I don't know if this is an apocryphal story, an actual story. Here's how it goes. It was a Christian executive who uh, got a healthy bonus and bought himself a brand new four-door, 12-cylinder BMW luxury automobile. You know the kind of car. Maybe you have one. Beautiful car. And he was very careful to make sure he thanked God for the blessing, the blessing of his new luxury car. He knew it came from God's hand, so he was very grateful. Shortly after buying the car, he's driving home from his office one day. He had to go through an urban neighborhood to get to the freeway. Suddenly, he hears a, a, a sound banging against the side of his car. He turns and sees a young boy standing at the curb, maybe 10 years old, uh, a side of the street holding a rock in his hand. And he realizes all of a sudden that kid has thrown a rock at his brand new BMW and hit it on the, side of the, on the other side of the, of the car. He stops the car, jams on his brakes, jumps out of the car, sees the ugly dent in the side of his brand new car. He's furious and he heads straight at the boy, intending to put the fear of God into him and to maybe get his dad and get his parents' address and make somebody pay for the damage to his brand new car. But he noticed as he's heading toward the boy, the boy didn't run away from him. The boy just stood there. And as he got to him, he saw the boy standing, holding the rock with tears running down his face. And he said, Mr., Mr., I'm sorry I hit your car, but my brother fell and hurt himself, and no one would stop to help me, so I threw the rock and hit your car, hoping you'd stop. The man looked over and saw a wheelchair tipped over on the side of the sidewalk, his older, heavier, older brother lying in the street with his face against the road, his face bleeding out, out of his nose. The man realized what the boy was trying to do. He goes over, helps the larger, older boy back into the wheelchair, stands it up, makes sure everybody's okay, and then he went back to his car. And he repented. He repented for misidentifying the blessing of God. He repented for having his heart more set on the condition of his car than the condition of the world. He repented for living his life at such a speed where, where a scared little boy had to throw a rock to get him to stop and see the blessing of God. And then he decided something else when he got home. He decided not to repair the dent. He left the dent in his brand new car so that every time he got in his car, he would see it and remember the blessing of God. See, in a sense, I think in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, as a great teacher, will starts by throwing a rock at our hearts. He throws a rock. That it's intended to dent our hearts by teaching us that the blessing of God is not always what we assume it is, that the blessing of God can be surprising, that the true blessing of God is found in blessing others, that the way of blessing comes through pursuing God with a hunger and a thirst, that the way of blessing sometimes includes pain and the transformation of that pain into the kingdom of God. That's how we begin the Sermon on the Mount. Will you bow your heads as we close? Lord Jesus, I thank you today for your word. Thank you for teaching us the way of blessing. You're a great teacher. Your word is living and active. And we confess, I confess, that so often we misidentify the, the affluence of our culture as the sum total of your blessing in our lives, and it's just not so. We need to be grateful of, of what we have, the things that we experience, the things that we enjoy. But teach us to notice when you want to pour out a whole different and deeper kind of blessing. Teach us to hunger and thirst for you. Teach us to grieve over the brokenness of the world and the brokenness in our own hearts. Teach us to offer your blessing, your grace, and your love to our neighbors. Teach us to live 